Brian Leising. I work in life insurance marketing here at Financial Brokerage, and I'd like to thank all of you for taking some time out of your day to join us for today's webinar on the SECURE Act. Uh, we're going to discuss four tax paying strategies using life insurance that you can use with your clients to help pay for this. Now, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with financial brokerage, we are a national marketing organization working with agents and advisors all around the country in areas of life insurance, annuities, long-term care, Medicare supplements, and uh, disability and critical illness insurance. I happen to work with life insurance, and uh, I work with many of you who are joining us this morning, so I, I thank you for that. Uh, we're going to try to keep this at about uh, a half hour uh, this morning. And uh, we'll be talking about one little provision of the SECURE Act. Now, some of you may remember that uh, this is a, uh, a new law that went into effect back in January. Uh, I can recall speaking to many people throughout January and February and, and you know, before the whole virus thing hit. And by the end of February, I was still speaking to many people who were not aware of the law and all the provisions within it. So um, I'm going to assume that your clients are also not aware of uh, what's in this law. I, I mentioned we're going to be talking about one provision in particular. We're not going to go through the whole thing, but uh, the one provision we're going to go over, it um, pertains to the tax treatment of qualified money. That's money like IRAs, 401ks, 403bs, money that has not yet been taxed. Somebody will have to pay the taxes at some point in time. Now, uh, to understand the change, we have to understand what uh, the law uh, used to do. So under the old law, uh, if a person passed away with IRA money intact, that could pass to their spouse, no problem. It's treated as, as the spouse's IRA. However, once that money goes to the next generation, what they call a non-spousal beneficiary, this is usually going to be an adult child, maybe a grandchild, uh, taxes have to be paid. Those people did have the option to stretch the taxes and, and stretch the distributions over their lifetime that would really mitigate any sort of tax hit that they would be facing at that point in time. Well, the new law changed all of that. Now, good thing is money can still pass uh, to a spouse and it's treated as the spouse's IRA. Um, you know, they pay taxes on that uh, over their lifetime. Uh, however, uh, what the uh, uh, Congress took away was that option for non-spousal beneficiaries to stretch those distributions over their lifetime. They can't do that anymore. Funds have to be distributed by the end of the 10th year after the death of the owner. So the law has uh, greatly compacted or shortened that uh, timeline that we have to pay the taxes. And that's going to accelerate when those taxes are due. We're going to have to pay taxes on a larger amount. Uh, at some point in time. Now, they don't have to take it evenly throughout that 10-year time period, but they do have to uh, take distributions by the end of the 10th year after the person's death. And they can choose uh, when you know, in between and, and how often uh, they take that money. So why is this an issue? Why are we talking about it? Well, this has essentially become the new estate tax. Now, we know with the federal estate tax that most people aren't going to have to pay that. Uh, if you have a couple, they have to be worth over $22 million right now uh, for the estate tax to become applicable. However, most people with retirement money are going to be affected by uh, the income taxes here uh, that have been accelerated due to the SECURE Act. Um, and I, As I mentioned uh, at the very start, uh, I would imagine most of your clients do not know that they are going to be leaving a federal income tax bill to their heirs when they pass away. And uh, since the law is so new, and again, word was just getting out about this before the virus hit, and then uh, everybody kind of forgot about it. So there's a really good chance your clients haven't done any planning for this event, and neither has anybody else's clients or people who don't have an advisor that they work with. So this is a tremendous opportunity for you to not only get in front of your clients right now to talk about this, but to get in front of brand new uh, prospective clients and use this as uh, your door opener uh, to the conversation about uh, their retirement planning situation and their tax planning situation. So uh, why do we want to plan for this? Well, you know, one, we want to get in front of our, our clients and uh, uh, help them out and get new clients. But this is important because the cost of waiting 
plan for this will likely be much, much greater uh, than it would be to take care of uh, the planning today. And, and we're alluding to the taxes. And we have to make a, a few assumptions here. Well, one of the things is actually not an assumption, the first two points here. Um, one, we know that federal income taxes right now are near all-time lows. I, I can recall, I, I think it was in 2001, uh, there was a tax law passed that lowered income tax rates at the federal level. And again, about uh, three years ago, there was another law passed that lowered taxes again. If you look back historically, I, I didn't put the chart in here, but I know there was a time in, in history where the uh, top tax bracket was uh, at least at 90%. And uh, throughout history, they've been much, much higher than they are today. Now, one of the things we know as well, uh, the current tax law expires in 2026, and the rates for individuals are going to revert back to where they were just a few years ago. So that's something we don't have to guess about. That's already built into the current tax law. It makes more sense to pay your taxes today than it would be to wait until 2026 to do that. Now, here's where we get into a little bit of a guessing game, but it's not that much of a guessing game. Uh, we also know that the national debt continues to grow. The last few years we've seen the, after you know, a few years of the deficits going down, the, the last three or four years deficits have started to go back up again tremendously, with this year being the worst by far uh, due to the, uh, the CARES Act bailouts uh, due to the, uh, the COVID-19 virus. So at some point in time, the government's going to have to make up for all of those outlays of money and you know they can only cut so many programs, there's a better than even chance that taxes are going to have to go back up again to help pay for the tremendous deficits we've seen the last several years and, and really uh, last several decades. Now, all of that aside, if none of that were true, uh, here's a, a, another reason why it makes sense to act today rather than wait. Now, if, if you look at the tax situations of people that pass away and, and the people that inherit their money, the adult children at their inheriting ages are usually at the near the end of their careers in their peak income earning years, and they are likely in the highest tax brackets they ever will be in their entire lifetimes. That is the exact wrong time to inherit money that they have to pay taxes on, right? And now they have an accelerated time frame for taking possession of that money and paying the taxes on it. So for really good reasons that it makes sense to take some action on this and to do it sooner rather than waiting until later. So I've come up with four ways and, and really four stages where you could help your clients by using life insurance to pay for the taxes that uh, their family is going to incur uh, very quickly due to the SECURE Act. And we're going to go over each one of these. I'll give a brief synopsis, and then we're going to dive into a uh, hypothetical example or two uh, using some clients uh, at the right ages that uh, I think would be uh, perfect for this sort of uh, uh, planning. We're going to talk about uh, first uh, doing a Roth IRA conversion right now or over the next few years. Uh, we'll talk about doing a Roth IRA conversion at death of uh, the first spouse, and then we'll uh, go over uh, the tax offset and tax elimination plans. And, and these two things happen upon the death of the second spouse. All right, so the first strategy, uh, this is a Roth IRA conversion. This is something we want to get started with right now with a particular client. Um, and the plan is really pretty simple. The IRA owner converts the IRA to a Roth IRA. Now, they don't necessarily want to do that all at once because uh, they're going to have to pay the taxes on any amount they convert in that given year. So we probably want to do this over a few years to uh, minimize the taxes that they have to pay every year. Now we can use life insurance to make up for the funds that are lost to taxes today. And life insurance can also become the new funding vehicle for these funds. We don't just have to convert the IRA to a Roth IRA. There's nothing wrong with moving that money wherever the client wants to. And I think an IUL would be a great funding vehicle for that uh, because you know, we have the option of taking loans out of that policy and not paying taxes on the growth of that money uh, ever again. So let's see what that might look like for a potential client. Uh, now, this sort of a strategy works well for uh, clients that are, I would say, in their early 60s. Uh, we need to have clients that are at least 59 and a half years old so they avoid the 10% penalty tax on 
qualified money. And uh, our example in this case, she fits the qualifications. Karen is 60 years old. She's in a 24% tax bracket, and she's got $500,000 in her IRA. And uh, Karen is concerned that if she waits too long, she's going to pay, pay more money in taxes than she would today. So we recommend that Karen takes money out of that IRA right now. Uh, we're going to do it over a period of five years. So she only needs to withdraw 100000 a year uh, for the next five years. And that's going to give her $76,000 every year after tax. Now, we're recommending that Karen place that money into an index universal life policy. And we're going to do that uh, over the next five years. So it's all in there by the time she's 65. Now, IULs work best if we give them a little bit more time for that money to build up inside the contract. So we're going to wait another 10 years until we start taking distributions from that IUL. Now, I ran an illustration earlier, and in Karen's case, the IUL was going to generate $46,000 a year in tax-free income uh, to her. Now, if we contrast that with uh, a do-nothing situation where she leaves the money in the IRA, if she would take income in that same period of time, she's only going to be able to take $40,000 uh, from that, that IRA, and she's going to have to pay taxes on that. Well, we're taking a little bit less and, uh, you know, it, by the time Karen passes away, assuming at age 91, uh, she would have only taken $700,000 from that IRA while she paid over $300,000 in taxes. Now, the IUL generates $6,000 more per year. Uh, in addition to her distributions, there is a death benefit that will be left over to go to her family. So now Karen's going to be able to distribute over a million dollars by taking action, moving that money into the IUL uh, over the next five years and paying the taxes today. In fact, she's gonna pay um, you know, slightly more than uh, a third of the total taxes as her do nothing option. So we have tremendously um, uh, increased Karen's distribution and, and certainly bettered her situation. Now that scenario assumes that Karen is insurable and she's in her early 60s. Well, what if we have a client who's a little bit older or maybe isn't insurable? Well, let's take a look at Bob because Bob is 75 years old and he's got the same half a million in excess retirement funds. Now, he's concerned about the taxes that he's going to have to pay on that money and his heirs will have to pay at some point in the future. You know, so he would like to leave this money to his adult son who's, who's 50 and, and his adult uh, well, by then, probably adult grandchildren. Uh, but, you know, Bob's got some problems. He's not insurable. He's in poor health. So what do we do with a client like this? Well, Bob doesn't have to be uh, the insured person to execute the same sort of strategy. Now, here's what the numbers look like, uh, just to give us a baseline. Um, if Bob keeps his qualified account, he's going to have to pay taxes on his required minimum distributions. We already said he doesn't need the money to live on, so he's going to have to pay taxes on his reinvested RMDs. And then when he passes away, his heirs are going to have to pay taxes. So he's looking at a total tax bill of over $300,000. If we convert this to a Roth today, uh, we're going to cap Bob's taxes at $125,000. So Bob is already coming out ahead. But I, I mentioned a second ago that uh, Bob doesn't have to be the... Uh, the insured uh, on an IUL to make a, a similar strategy work to uh, what we looked at with, with Karen. So uh, here's what we're going to do for Bob. We can better his situation. We're still going to place the money into an, an IUL, but this time we're going to use Bob's adult son as the insured. Now, Bob is still going to be the owner of the policy, and he gets to name the beneficiary. But we're going to Put that money in over five years to do two things. One, to lessen the, uh, the taxes that Bob has to pay each and every year. But uh, that also gives us enough time to keep that IUL policy from becoming a modified endowment contract. So Bob's son still has the ability to take tax-free loans from the contract uh, when he hits his retirement years. So what does that look like altogether? Well, we're going to move a total of 375000 from Bob's IRA over the next five years, uh, that's going to generate uh, over $50,000 a year to Bob's son for 30 years 
uh, during his uh, retirement years. So our total distributions by enacting this plan uh, are going to exceed $1.6 million. Now, if we go back a couple slides, we'll, we'll see Bob's, what I would call his, his do-nothing plan, right? And uh, with that, he's got $500,000 on which he has to pay taxes. And you know what? I thought I had the number in here. If I remember right, uh, the total Bob would have passed by doing nothing would have been just shy of $600,000. So we have certainly more than doubled what Bob passes to the next generation just by moving that money that he didn't need to live on into an IUL on his adult son. So again, it doesn't matter if your uh, client is insurable or not. They don't necessarily have to be the insured for this sort of a plan to work. All right, let's move on to uh, the second strategy. Now, with this strategy, we're going to kick the can down the road a little bit. We're going to assume that your client uh, doesn't want to do anything today or over the next five years. They would rather wait until um, one of the spouses passes away to uh, conduct this Roth IRA conversion. So this obviously works with married couples. And um, what we're going to do is, is something very similar to what we would do with um, uh, the estate tax if we had had two people. We're going to purchase a life insurance policy in an amount equal to the projected taxes. And what's going to happen here with the spouses is uh, the IRA owner passes away, their spouse receives the tax-free death benefit from the life insurance company, and they can now uh, conduct a Roth IRA conversion immediately and they have the funds to pay those taxes all in one lump sum. We don't have to stretch it out over a period of time. So let's take a look at an example and, and see what that looks like. Uh, we're going to take a look at, at Bill and Mary. They both happen to be 62 years old, and Bill has accumulated uh, almost $200,000 in his IRA today. And at a 5% uh, interest rate in 20 years, that magically works out to $500,000. And let's say Bill passes away at age 82. Well, assuming Mary's at a 35% tax bracket, she's going to have to pay uh, the IRS $175,000. So she won't get to keep that whole $500,000. Uh, she'll have to pay the IRS some money. So let's give Bill a life insurance policy for $175,000 so Mary can pay those taxes all at once. Well, to do that, I, I ran the numbers, and I, I think Bill was a standard uh, non-smoker. Uh, I ran a GUL, and uh, the premiums came out to be roughly $3,500 per year. So if Bill passes away in 20 years, we've paid $70,000. Now, that's a little bit of money, but keep in mind, someone has to either pay the IRS $175,000, or we have to pay the insurance company $70,000. By utilizing this strategy, you have saved the family $105,000. So Bill and Mary are definitely coming out ahead by enacting this, this Roth IRA conversion at, at death strategy. Now, I've got one more uh, example for Bill and Mary here. Let's say, for instance, that they would like to get their premiums back as well. It doesn't cost them much more to do that, so you can give them a second option. Now, I ran the numbers and, and I did some rounding, but it turns out that a $275,000 policy would work out uh, just about perfectly in their case. So here's why. Uh, at $275,000, Bill's cumulative premiums come to $96,000. Uh, we could round that up to 100, right? If we add 100 to our taxes due of 175,000, we get the 275,000 amount. So now Mary has enough money to pay the taxes due and she can also recoup all of their expenses from premiums for the life insurance policy. So now she can inherit that full uh, amount uh, after the conversion and uh, enjoy the tax-free income uh, that originally started with Bill's IRA. All right, so that's the, the Roth conversion at death strategy. Now, strategies three and four are, are very similar. In fact, four is just a variation on, on number three. But uh, we'll start with number three. And this is the strategy that is probably most similar to traditional estate tax planning. If you've ever done any work with that in the past, this is going to sound very similar. So with the tax offset strategy, um, 
we know that IRA funds pass to a spouse with no penalties. So we're going to take advantage of that. And uh, with, with a couple, we're not going to do the conversion upon the first death. We're just going to let the funds pass to that, that second spouse. And we're not going to worry about that until that second spouse passes away. Well, what we're going to do to help them pay the taxes, or help the family, the couple is going to purchase a survivorship policy that will provide tax-free funds upon that second death. Now, we're going to purchase an amount equal to the projected income taxes due so that the family can inherit the full value of that IRA because they have the money to pay the taxes that are due at that point in time. Well, let's take a look at an example and see how that might work for a hypothetical couple. Uh, we're going to take a look at Roger and Judy. Now, they're both 65 years old, and like everybody else, they have an extra half a million dollars in retirement funds that they like to pass uh, to their heirs if, if they could and uh, minimize and maybe eliminate the taxes. Well, we're going to do the math here for Roger and Judy, and we're going to assume they live to roughly life expectancy at age 90, and that $500,000 IRA uh, we think would be valued at $1.3 million. Uh, if the last one passed away at that point in time, assuming a 37% tax bracket, uh, their heirs would have to pay almost half a million dollars to the IRS. Now, that leaves the heirs only uh, just over $800,000. Not bad, but it's not $1.3 million, which is what they really wanted to leave behind. So here's what we can do to help Roger and Judy. We're going to purchase a survivorship life insurance policy for that $493,000 amount. Now, they're going to have to pay some premiums for that, uh, just over $9,000 a year. Now, by age 90, they will have paid in over $200,000 at that rate. Now, that's okay because if you look up above a, a couple of uh, rows, the IRS is going to take almost half a million dollars. I would much rather pay $200,000 to an insurance company than pay half a million dollars to the IRS. By doing this, the net amount that passes to their heirs is still over a million dollars. So here's what the three scenarios might look like for Roger and Judy, or I guess the, the two potential scenarios here. Their do-nothing plan would cost them $500,000. The SUL plan cost is going to be just over $200,000. We saved the family a quarter of a million dollars in this particular situation. So we've certainly bettered Roger and Judy's situation by doing this. Now, we can actually um, improve upon that situation a little bit. It's going to take a little bit more premium and a little bit higher face amount. But here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to eliminate the uh, federal income taxes completely for Roger and Judy. So if they like uh, strategy three, they're really going to like strategy four. Now, to do this, we need to name a charity as the beneficiary of the IRA. We're going to do that because charities do not have to pay federal income taxes. They can inherit all of that money, all of that growth that has never been taxed, all of the basis that has never been taxed, and they don't have to pay taxes on that either. Um, but that leaves the family with nothing. So we're going to have to purchase a survivorship uh, life insurance policy, not in an amount equal to the taxes, but in an amount equal to the full IRA value at their life expectancy. So now when the clients pass away, the charity is going to get the full value of the asset and their family is going to get the full value of the asset through a tax-free death benefit. And uh, your clients are going to love uh, this last point. The IRS is going to receive absolutely nothing. So let's see what that looks like for Roger and Judy if they decide to take this just one step further. Uh, luckily, Roger and Judy already regularly give money to several charities, so justifying this uh, sort of a plan to uh, underwriters won't be a big deal at all. Uh, Roger's going to go ahead and name uh, a charity as beneficiary of his IRA, and then he and Judy are going to purchase that survivorship universal life policy equal to their projected IRA value at age 90. So here's what that looks like. I, I mentioned the premium was going to be a little bit higher, and it is, uh, because now they have to get a uh, survivorship policy for $1.3 million, that's going to cost them almost $25,000 a year. Now, by the time they hit age 90, they will have paid over $600,000 in, but their heirs are going to receive $1.3 million completely tax-free. Their favorite charity is going to receive 
1.3 million, completely tax-free. If we add those two numbers together and subtract out what they paid in premiums, they are still passing over $2 million after uh, the death of the second spouse. Uh, here's what those plans would look like, uh, actually all three plans now. If Roger and Judy stay with what they have and do absolutely nothing, when they both pass away, they're leaving uh, an $800,000 legacy. If they follow the tax offset plan and just provide enough to pay the taxes, they're doing a little better. They're leaving over a million dollars behind. Now, if they follow the tax elimination plan, they have nearly doubled the previous plan. And even when you account for the premiums paid, they're still leaving over $2 million behind. If you're able to show these sort of numbers to your clients, they're going to jump at the chance to do plan number three and wonder why they didn't do that much, much earlier. So to recap the four strategies here uh, pretty quickly, um, again, these are all different stages throughout the planning process in your clients' lives where they might um, pay the, opt to pay the, the taxes that we know are going to be due. So it, it's, it's just a matter of when do we pay them? Do we wait until that 10th year after the, the death of the second spouse, or do we start paying them today over the next five years, or somewhere in between, or some combination uh, thereof? So our clients could choose to start converting that Roth and put the money into an IUL on themselves today, or if they're not insurable, we could use an adult child who is insurable, and uh, our IRA owner can still be owner of that policy and maintain control over that. Uh, if they don't want to do that, they could opt to uh, plan on a Roth IRA conversion at the death of the first spouse, and that's pretty easy to calculate and plan for. Or uh, they could also uh, plan on providing the death benefit at the death of the second spouse in an amount either uh, that either pays the entire taxes or eliminates taxes completely. Now, how do you know which of these strategies is right for your clients? Well, you really need to sit down and talk to them and uh, get a good picture of their entire situation. You want to consider their retirement income, their current tax strategy, their adult children's financial situation. We need to know uh, what sort of tax brackets they're in and, and where they project to be in uh, down the road. And with all that information, we can, uh, you know, do our best to figure out which of these options is going to be the most tax efficient, which is going to be the most cost effective. You know, keep in mind there are life insurance premiums involved here. And the bottom line, though, I mean, all of this doesn't really matter if it doesn't make the clients comfortable and if it's not what they want to do. So we want to do all of this planning and, uh, you know, make a case for what we think is going to work best. But we also want to be listening to our clients and make sure that we're doing something that, that they are comfortable uh, with uh, executing when it's all said and done. So those are the, the four ideas, and uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. Hopefully that's given you some uh, uh, great ammunition to get out there and get in front of your clients again and conduct some policy reviews and you know, also use it as talking points with new prospective clients uh, that uh, you may be meeting with here. So, yeah, I want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. I'm going to open it up for questions right now. And uh, as I mentioned, you can go ahead and type those uh, in the control panel that uh, you see there on the right. And if I can remember how to navigate these again. All right. Can we get a copy of the presentation? Um, potentially. I am recording this. So, um, Assuming everything goes right, um, I should be able to send you a copy of uh, the uh, the video that uh, I hope we can have out on YouTube. Okay, Let's see if there are any other questions here. All right. I don't see any showing up there. So, yeah, if, if you do have some questions you think of later, uh, feel free to email us or uh, call us here at Financial Brokerage at 800-475-5555. Uh, 
Uh, again, I work with Life Marketing. I work with many of you. Uh, my counterparts in Life Marketing include Gary Peterson and also Keith Candido, and any one of us would be able to help with any of these situations. Yeah, so thank you for joining us, and uh, have a fantastic day.